What are the most decadent experiences on cruise ships? The ones that have often left me shaking my head, wondering if cruise lines are simply going too far. I'm not talking here about crazy features like water parks, go-karts, zip lines, roller coasters, wave riders, and so on. These are something much more, dare I even say, questionable. If you're new here, welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge, and I'm here to make it easy and fun to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations. Food is an important part of my cruise experience, and I'm sure yours too. There's lots of it on board, but do we actually need even more? The lines certainly think so, and they keep adding new food adventures, food events, to constantly try and stay ahead of each other. Now, from all the ones that I've had, there's three that get my highest decadent rating. First of all, chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. Midnight buffets have largely been scrapped and replaced on many cruise lines by chocolate buffets. I first came across one on Cunard, but the ultimate chocolate buffet is on Azamara. It's a massive big buffet. It's over the top. People cram in there and they are just chocolate treat after chocolate treat after chocolate treat. Chocolate has become a big thing on cruise ships. There's even a chocolate factory on MSC Cruises' biggest ships where they make and sell a huge range of chocolates. The next decadent event is around caviar. Now, you can get caviar on demand on some lines like in Cunard Queen's Grill, but on two lines, there are whole caviar nights. For example, on Europa 2, they have a huge section in the restaurant which becomes a caviar station. Also on Seabourn, they have a caviar night which is held in the theatre and there's champagne and caviar on tap. Extremely grand, extremely decadent. The third example is around big food events. So for example, on Seabourn, they have the officer's deck party. These are stations spread all around the pool deck where the various officers serve drinks and food. There's just an endless supply and a huge range of fantastic and incredible food. I've also had these big grand buffets on lines like Oceania and Azamara, which is a big buffet on a sea day once per cruise, which is again, endless stations of food. Now, these were all extremely well-received events and popular, but it did leave me wondering if it's time to dial back and focus just on upping the main restaurant, the buffet, and the casual dining venues. I'm a little bit so-so on this one. Where do you stand? Is this too decadent or should it be kept? But before you make your mind up, consider this very closely linked series of decadent events. Lions are now pushing these food experiences we're seeing on board off the ship too, and they're creating unique passenger-only events on land as an extension of these ship dining experiences. Now, while some focus on culture, like concerts, I've been to off lines like, say, Viking, food features in many, if not most, of these affairs. Now, two examples that I thought I would talk about that stand out for me as prime examples are, first of all, on Port Gargan. They have a private island barbecue called Motu Mahana in Tahana. The entire ship, passengers, and most of the crew are moved en masse onto a private island for a massive barbecue event. I've had similar events of, for example, Windstar, when the entire ship is bussed and taken to a venue for some kind of food-based activity. Azamara have their As Amazing Evenings. There's normally one per cruise. It's a one-off event. Again, much of the crew goes on these to help set them up, and all of the passengers go. One of the most memorable was a food hall event held in France with lots of local producers, cheese, wine, chocolates, so many different types of food. Now, these are logistically extremely complex and no doubt pretty costly. And it left me wondering if that cost, which of course is in all of our fares, is still the best value. Is it a decadent and costly distraction or something that helps make our vacation truly unforgettable? All of us that go on a cruise vacation knows just how hard the crew work. Most of them are on six month or longer contracts. They work long days and they work seven days a week. They could be working 12 or more hours a day. Yet, as I've shown, increasingly the crew are having to play an ever growing role in creating these additional experiences for passengers on top of their normal job. Now, on most cruises I've been on, in addition to the food experiences I'm talking about, crew are now expected to provide a whole raft of other decadent but much loved experiences. For example, towel animals. I love them, we all love them. Crew less so, based on comments I saw on a recent discussion on crewcenter.com, which is a crew-based site. There are books on how to do towel animals sold on Holland America. 
classes are run on Windstar, classes are run on Holland America and other cruise lines. They take an enormous amount of time for crew to make these tile animals. If you multiply that by several days, they do them across a year, the numbers and amount of time it takes crew to make these animals is enormous. It also creates a lot of laundry. And of course, then there's a knock on effect of the amount of work, detergents, processing, and kind of, you might argue from an environmental perspective. The second area is crew demonstrations and displays. These are also popular, whether it's ice carving demonstrations, vegetable carving demonstrations, or displays on how they make food. These are big displays, they're big demos, they're very popular, but do we really need them? Are we just taking up more time of the crew and what about the waste that goes into these? Another really popular activity is crew shows. We get to see the range of talent that is amongst the crew on most ships, singing, dancing, whatever. They tend to run them once a week during a cruise. So again, it takes a lot of time by the crew to rehearse and perform them on top of their job. They still have to do their normal job. Now, as much as I like these, again, I keep asking, do we really need them to make our vacation memorable? Or is it just a little bit too decadent and a little bit of a step too far? However, contrast that with the on-ship cultural immersions that many, many lines now have. This is where they bring on board local entertainers, various people from maybe some indigenous groups, performance troops. And the idea is to give you an insight into the peoples and the culture on the place that you're visiting. Now, these two have become part of the cruise experience, especially when I've been on more exotic itineraries. One of the most memorable was when I was on part of a world cruise on Cunard and we were in New Zealand and they brought on board some Maori singers, performers and dancers. They spoke about the folklore, they spoke about the history, they spoke about the culture. It was really, really quite uh, revealing. However, we could have just gone and seen that locally as we found out the next day and did. On Paul Gauguin, when I was in French Polynesia, they brought on board, again, troops of people that performed traditional dances and again, explained the culture and the history. When I was on a Mekong River cruise with Cross Europe in Cambodia, they brought on board some Apsara dancers who came and gave this incredible performance of dancing. But again, the next day we were out touring and we came across some local people who again performed it for us. On many European river cruises, I've been where locals have come on board and sung around, whether it's the waltzing or the history of Germany or whatever. Now these, though, feel pretty touristy and pretty cliched when they come on board. It's almost like a Disney-fied version of the culture. It's almost a little bit of a, a, a westernized take on it. It does feel a little bit cynical to me. It does feel a little bit decadent because we could surely be heading out of the community, putting our money into the community to experience much more authentic immersion in situ. The thing that sways me around whether these are a key part of the cruise experience and should stay on board is what I've discovered is all of them have normally been created through charities. They're not commercial ventures. So it does give us a chance to support charities and often they do extra donations. Again, a decadent thing, should it be ditched or should it stay? I'm pretty torn on this one and you may be too. However, on this next one, I know many, many of you will be in the ditch camp that these are far too decadent and this should be removed. The reason I know this is many people have commented on past episodes that they feel this is one area that they see is not only overly decadent, but actually negatively impacts the whole cruise experience for the majority of passengers on cruises and on cruise ships. And that is the rapid growth of large chunks of ship real estate being closed off to the bulk of passengers. There are two particular areas where this is growing. The first of these are access-only areas for people cruising in the premium cabins in the suites. Now, what we're seeing on board is there's two basic approaches to ships that I've sailed on, certainly. The first of those is the ship within the ship concept. And this is favored by lines like, for example, MSC Cruises, who have their yacht club and Norwegian Cruise Line, which has their haven area. In here, you have the suites, you have often a swimming pool, a deck, a restaurant, a bar, a concierge service, and so on. These are self-contained and are only accessible by people staying in those suites. The other thing that I'm seeing, which is perhaps more common, is where there's dedicated deck areas or restaurants, such as on Celebrity Edge Class and Virgin Voyages, where they're kind of Richard's Club. This is an area where you have an area where only people in suites can go. They can suntan, there might be a pool there, there might be a bar, and often many of these will have their own restaurant. The second thing that people are objecting to as just being too decadent is the growth of the paid for retreat areas 
on board ships. Now, anyone can go, no matter what grade of cabin you're in, but you pay a fee to access a very specific cabana area where you'll often get things like maybe some food, some snacks, some drinks, some a television or whatever included. Now, the most glitzy of these that I've seen, because there are many, many on board different ships, are on many of the new big princess ships. So things like uh, Sky Princess, Discovery Princess, which have this whole sanctuary area. And then you have Seabourn, again, which has an amazing retreat area with very plush seating. And it's a very beautiful area. But so many lines also have them Holland America and on and on and on. Now, is this a case of it's perfectly OK to be decadent and you have those areas for those who can afford them? Or is it perhaps a step too far, taking up too much space and closes down and reduces the amount of space for other people? But talking of affording something, what about this particular one? Going to see a show on Broadway or in London's West End is expensive. It's really, really expensive. And that is a pretty big luxury for many people, including me and perhaps you, especially if you want to take your family and you have to perhaps travel up to London, travel to New York, stay over, whatever. Now, I love going to see shows and it costs me an absolute fortune every single year to go and see as many shows as I want to see. But that whole extravagance, that whole decadence can be enjoyed on a cruise. And the cost, of course, is already covered in your fare. It means that I and any family I'm traveling with can see actual Broadway and West End shows, often with the cost from either Broadway or the West End in those particular shows. But there is a big catch when it comes to this whole area. I've been on ships and I've seen Broadway and West End shows like Rock of Ages, Kinky Boots, Priscilla Queen of the Desert. I just missed out seeing the Hot New Musical 6. I've also seen a full Blue Man group and Choir of Man shows, which are big in places like Las Vegas. Now, the watch out here is while most lines have their own shows, they're actually specifically created for those ships. But you can only see legit full Broadway shows on very few cruise ships and particularly the most eminent of those is Norwegian Cruise Lines. You can see specially created Cirque du Soleil shows with their actual trained cast on other cruise lines, including things like MSC Cruises. So it avoids you having to go to, say, Las Vegas to see those particular shows. So it's pretty luxurious. It's pretty decadent. And for me, it's a plus being able to go and see actual Broadway shows as part of my cruise fare on board. What, what do you think on that particular one? It's pretty clear that the lines are increasingly going to keep trying out more and more experiences to find things that are different and unique from the lines that they compete with to try and keep us going on board and trying them out. Now, I, like you, I'm sure, we get swept up in them. We get swept up by the excitement. We get swept up by the novelty, the uniqueness of them. But increasingly, as I'm experiencing these things, I stop. I kind of look around and think, is this getting a bit crazy, is getting a bit out of hand. Is this really adding to and making my trip unforgettable? Is this actually just making my fare more costly because they have to cover the expense of all of these experiences? Is it time to focus back on the basics or do we look at these and think, no, these make our crews more memorable. They make them more unforgettable and they absolutely should be kept. I'd love to know what you think. And as you think about that, why not find out about some things that actually make no sense on a cruise ship at first, but do once you know why? And they're here in this video here, including why cruise ship pools are so small. Click now and I'll see you over there.